Okay, Ron, so welcome to the Popscast. So if you could just kind of update us on where you're at, how you're doing, and how you're dealing with this new normal. Well, when I was in Manhattan with my wife and daughter, uh, uh, the week that it quarantined, and we went into, and I, and I got in the car and I drove to our place in Asbury Park, New Jersey, which is on the shore of New Jersey, about an hour out of the city. And I wanted to pick up some things to bring back because, I mean, it was a feeding friends in every supermarket. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so when I got down here and got the things, I called Donna and Donna says, don't come back. Charlotte is sick. Our daughter, Charlotte, um, who's come to stay with us during the quarantine. And um, so I said, OK, well, I'll stay down here a few days. It ended up being nine days because Donna got sick. So um, then I went back to New York after um, about nine days, and uh, then I got sick. But I was only sick for like 24 hours. It was like a, a, I went to bed with a fever, sweated all night long, got up the next day, felt better, was weak, and that was it. And Don and Charlotte mm -hmm. kind of went through some of the symptoms, but never the chest or the breathing. So uh, uh, knock on wood, we're all doing well now, and uh, – Don and I are back down in Asbury Park and, and enjoying it. And, you know, hey, just uh, we just got to go with the flow of uh, this uh, thing we don't know about, you know? Yeah, a lot, of, a lot we don't know about. Well, and everyone's okay, so that's great. Yes, everyone's okay. Before you were, before you were a fabulous singer, it was actually after you were a fabulous singer, you, you were hired on The Guiding Light. Yes. I made my living singing. Some years were old <laughs> until 1994, uh, uh, when I had just finished a, a production of Man of La Mancha, full stage, full orchestra, big chorus uh, with the Portland, Oregon Opera, Portland Opera, huge, wonderful production. And while I was there, I was uh, the next job I had to do, I had to do it in the Paper Mill Playhouse, South Pacific. So I did went from Portland, Maine, back to New York, uh, which was I could live at my apartment and work in a, a good theater and did a production of South Pacific. Now, while I was doing South Pacific, they had good runs there. They had like six to eight weeks of runs when, when that was, I don't think it's that long anymore. But when I was, I got to live at home when I was doing South Pacific at Paper Mill. Now, each night I would drive home. I had a car. Each night I would drive go back to my place on the Upper West Side, I would drive in and I would see the skyline and I would say, I would scream, I wanna work in New York City! And I would scream at it like five or six times. And I would do that almost every night, except when I took people home with me. But the, the, thing, that, that was, the, the, the thing that I was hollering about was because my daughter, our daughter Charlotte at that time was, was five years old, which is 1994, and I wanted to stay in the city. And I said, look, I'll do the, the, the 15th Deuteronomy and Cats or, the, you know, the, I don't care. I, I just want to do something in New York, thinking, of course, it was going to be a musical. Well, then uh, I got a call from my agent and said, and I told him, I said, look, I want you to investigate some TV. I, I want to, I'll do anything, you know, just something. So he got me seen on this, uh, this show called Guiding Light. Uh, and um, I went in and read and I really worked on it with a, with a TV person and felt good about it. And uh, uh, so they really liked me. They were very interested, which I was shocked uh, because I didn't have any experience. But they said, we're going to go to we're going to go to L.A. <laughs> and we've got to see the L.A. market, you know, to cast this role. This is a big role, Ron. So I said, OK. So they go to L.A. and they don't find him because <laughs> the bar was so high. <laughs> the bar range set no walk. No actor in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, to make a long story short, yes, I got the role. And uh, I had no idea it, uh, it would last for 15 years uh, until it closed. Uh, 
but uh, it was a great thing because it allowed me to sing on the side. I did a lot of recordings and PBS things and, um, and got to be there for my daughter, Charlotte. Uh, <laughs> I, I was, you know, that was, that's what I think I was leading to, that, that I wanted to be there for her. I didn't want to be the absent father, because I had one, you know, and uh, so I don't want to, do, but so it, you see, it all worked out. Was the, um, and here I am. That's right. <laughs> here, you here you are in Asbury get, Park. Get <laughs> You're in Asbury Park. Just I'm in Asbury, yes. <laughs> So I can imagine that the production schedule on a soap opera is similar to a musical. Oh, it's insane! Oh, it's That's totally nice. insane. It's, it's insane. insane. Well, you know, you know how you know how fast and furious. Just the, you know, the dress rehearsal of the, the pops in. Then the, I mean, it's all just it, it, the first read through. Then the and it's it's like it's organized madness or something, chaos. Or something. But everybody knows how to do his or her thing. And it's the same way in TV. You, I, you go, you, you look at all this insanity happening, you know, two seconds before you go on. And then all of a sudden everybody stops. <laughs> it's like perfect. It's, it is it really beyond me. I mean, the lighting and the, I mean, people running around and all of a sudden it just stops. Five, four, three, you know? <laughs> it's, it's really, and, and, but it, it, it is like, it is like what we do in, even in the symphony world. It's all about the money. It's all about moving it. it get less uh, speed. Let's get through it. We got to make sure we can get through it because, you know, we only have one rehearsal or two, two. but it, that's, that's part of, you know, what we do. And it, it, we have to learn to be faster. I can't do that. Well, you're going to have to, you're going to, you know, yeah. I want to ask you something on because being that you came from the opera world and then theater, and of course, we did two Broadway shows together. Uh -huh. And um, Ron also was uh, playing Ben Stone in the last revival of Follies with Steve Sondheim, Bernadette Peters. And I want to ask you what, what it's like uh, working with living composers <laughs> as opposed to the others. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning well, Steve I can, Sondheim. I can, and, I can go either way. Well, I, well um, the two things that I remember that, that Steve told me, well, no, the one thing, and then another thing I'll tell you about Jerry Herman told me. And one was about the character from Stephen, and the other one was about the music, not the lyrics, the music, which I'll go. So when I... I told Steve, I told Bernadette, standing in the wings, right before we go on to, to, to do the scene to where I sing, to uh, 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 the, road, the Road Not Taken. Um, it, it's, and I was standing there and I said, you know, I just, I can't wrap my head around this, this, this role, this song. What the, how do I interpret, interpret it? She said, well, ask Steve. I said, Steve? I, like, I don't know Steve. I mean, she knows Steve. So the next night, she, she handed me, in the same place, standing in the wings, she said, here's Steve's uh, phone number. He said, call him after three <laughs> or something. So I did that, and I told him that the trouble I was ha having. And he said one word. He went, two words. <laughs> You're lying. You're lying. The character is lying. Everybody the principles, they're all lying. But he had a way of just saying, bump, bump, and it, you went, ah. <laughs> it, it's like a, the, the magic box open. It, made, it communicated with me. That's the one thing. And then the other thing with Jerry Herman, I remember, um, it, it was in the song, I Won't Sing Roses, uh, from uh, Mac and Mabel. It's a great song. And, and everybody's into the talky thing now. I won't send roses. I won't send roses. I won't send roses. I, 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 I tried that, and it didn't fit well. And 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 Jerry Herman got on me. Jerry Herman said, "I want those notes, Ron. Ron, I won't send roses. No, I won't send roses. I won't send roses. I want those notes." I said, "Okay, Jerry, you got them." <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. And uh, those are two little things. 
Well, I'm, I'm just going to chime in because, you know, I conducted a production of Mac and Mabel and, and Jerry <laughs> sat down next to me one day and said, is there any way I can persuade you not to make I Won't Send Roses sound like a cha-cha? <laughs> and what he meant was slow it down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've been very fortunate to, to work with these Yeah, guys. well, I think you more than I, but I, I, yeah, I mean, and you've got some of the real contemporaries. I worked a little, a little bit with Alan Menken, I, and I, I really like like his talent very and he's a contemporary of us and and, and uh, jason robert browns too i i think he is a tremendous talent um so there's some good guys out there um uh, i wish i'd had more time to work with them uh, but I, I, that the, the the whole from the 80s on i think uh, maybe it started earlier on but from the when the when the english invasion happened i think the whole concept of singing Broadway became different and uh, it started a movement of the pop opera the poppy singing croony off the voice you can't even hear you if you, you know it's a real mic thing I um, that I never understood because I never sang that well that that way I, and uh, I um, it'd be uh, I don't know what are your thoughts on that Larry I mean about uh, how the just well I agree and what happened was, I think, when we started in theater, you know, I'm talking about the 70s and 80s, they still were not overly miked. And uh, I've said this in other interviews. I remember the first few Broadway shows, including Little Night Music, with two mics in the pit, one on the left side and one on the right side. And the only people who had microphones were the principals. You know, and I did a tour with Gene Simmons, not not Gene Simmons from Kiss, Gene Simmons, the, the British actor. Uh. And and she had a body mic, and Hermione Gingold had a body mic. The rest of the casts, not necessarily, there were shotgun mics, and you had to sing, and the conductor had to hold the orchestra down. And that was the way we did it. By the time the British musicals came in, there were sound systems every person in the chorus had a body mic and they could totally rebalance. They didn't have to have voices. It wasn't required. They could do anything with a microphone and they did. And now it's like it's a all. sonic assault coming from. <laughs> well, I, I've said this very often that I'll be sitting out now that I'm orchestrating more, I'll be sitting out in the house and I'll say to the salmon, why do we have an atomic piano? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How can a piano drown out? three trumpets and three trumpets <laughs> but but that is what happens so yeah and and of course the singing has changed because as you know you were taught to project mm -hmm. and now they'll someone will say you sing a little softer you know. <laughs> not, yeah. that, not that we listen to them <laughs> yeah well thank god what's behind, what's behind me young man <laughs> yeah oh boy yeah yeah, we've been lucky, though. <clears throat> we were really, really uh, lucky. I will tell you one thing. John Reardon, who, who I know was your, one of your mentors. Yes. When we, when we were doing Colette, I said to John, you know, John, you're not singing with the chorus. And he said, well, my boy, I'm not in the chorus. <laughs> <laughs> I've never that's, forgotten that. That's, that's right. That's right. <laughs> He was great. Oh, he was a great mentor. I mean, because, you know, I was raised in East Texas, in Nacogdoches, Texas. My father was an evangelical minister. I didn't know anything about New York or the theater or movies or anything. All I knew about was going to church and, and, and every time the door was open and singing. And I loved to sing. And uh, that's where I really learned to sing. People say, where did you learn to sing? I said, well, I was in church all the time, you know, and, and, uh, Plus, I was a singing being, so it was a great, great outlet for me. You know, you know, Ron, I was thinking, we, of course, have done many concerts together with various pops orchestras, and you, you've sung with uh, Pasadena Pops with Michael Feinstein conducting, and you're often called in, you, you do all the standards, like you say, all the John Raitt stuff, all the Alfred Drake stuff, yeah. all the classic stuff, but... but uh, you, you're always very flexible. Usually, 
Yeah. Whatever I said to you, will you sing this? You go, well, okay, if I have to. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you really are able to sing at all. Is there anything you pr particularly enjoy doing with Pops concerts? Well, no, I, I like more of the big bandy stuff now. I mean, for the crooning stuff, uh, you know, uh, that's what I love. Uh, last time I worked with Michael in New York at Zyko Hall, just this past February, right after we worked together, uh, Larry, uh, Michael did mention, you know, uh, Billy Eckstein. He said, I got some Billy Eckstein. I said, I would love to just <laughs> try and see how that feels, you know. Um, the, you know I don't have to sing G's and F's, you know. You can really just just talk. Yeah. And, you know, I, 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 and so I said, yeah, let's do it, you know. Of course, that was before the world changed. <laughs> yeah, of course. No, but you've always been very flexible with that stuff. And I know you enjoy uh, singing with the drummer. <laughs> yes, yes. Instead of having to carry the ball yourself. Ron, with the new, new generation, how are they with the, this kind of great heritage of music from the past? Are they interested, engaged with it? Some of them are. Indifferent? Yeah, some of them are and some of them aren't. And then it... Some of them get it later and start whenever they get it. I mean, it's a, there's a lot to, well, hopefully they learn that in music uh, history in college. And a lot of schools now have a musical theater departments. So, and I'm sure the musical theater history and all that is taught. So they do know about Jerome Kern and Victor Herbert, you know, and they do know those, those earlier guys. Um, but, you know, they, it's, it's their, now look at their challenge. Look at their next challenge. Mm -hmm. Broadway closes. Right, right. I mean. over and closed. I mean, no matter, <laughs> no matter what, over, bang. So now this is going to be an interesting. Well, I think it'll be. For artists. It's good for the, good to like, you know, grease the creative wheels. Right? It's just. Time to get creative. Yeah. Well, the good news is, I, I believe that the uh, symphonic pops world is going to come back before perhaps Broadway and theater, especially like the Pasadena Pops playing at the Arboretum, since it's an outdoor venue, it's a little mm. bit easier to uh, set it up <laughs> with the tables miles apart and, and to, to spread out a little bit. And uh, I know some of the orchestras are now cutting down the orchestra a bit and doing it for that in and doing Zoom concerts, but, but there's nothing like a live orchestra playing together, everybody sitting close and the singers on stage and... Uh, so, um, Ron, do you have, like, everyone seems to have, like, a pandemic project. What are you, a project you've always wanted to complete or start or... You know, my wife and I have done a lot of uh, uh, cleaning out of closets and drawers mm -hmm. and, and taking to charities and and or storage so that that which we never had time for before we finally have had time and it's been great mm -hmm. i mean we've been yeah we're still married <laughs> <laughs> well that's a real concern for some people when this happened uh but what about like any creative projects that you've mm -hmm. always no oh. <laughs> other than teaching voice yeah. teaching yeah that's yeah yeah and then uh, since so many people are using Zoom to teach, um, have you figured out anything on how to just make that so that you're you're sane after teaching? Well, I, yeah, that, that's a challenge. That's yeah, a, a, t a teaching on Zoom is a is a challenge. Now, the the problem I would have with it, it uh, if I were in a university situation, is accepting a new student. And right. of course, you got all these freshmen coming in. Everybody's new. How do you, because in the room is so important. Yeah, no, I work with the students I've worked with for years. So they're the ones I can do this because we have shorthand, we have uh, communication right. skills, and I just say a word or here or there and they, they get it. Yeah. I just don't like the audio. I don't like the right. audio. Yeah. yeah. And you're starting from scratch with new students and it's... And it's yeah. And I and I have a feeling here. There's every day at, at the Zoom company, wherever it is. I don't know what it is, but they they've got these. They're they're upgrading everything. It's going to be an incredible experience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it still won't be an experience of being a lot being live and in the room with great 
artists. Mm -hmm. And that energy. I got to tell just a funny story. What? When we, when, and this can be on, on the program. For, when Ron and I were doing the show, Teddy and Alice, we were in Baltimore. And the, the difference between being the conductor of an opera company or a musical is this. On an opera company, you walk in and they take you to a dressing room and it has your name on the door where it says maestro. In musical theater, your dressing room says gents <laughs> in the door. <laughs> and we were backstage at the Mechanic Theater in Baltimore. And Ron saw that my dressing room was the one that had gents on the door. And he said, I have an awfully big dressing room and you're gonna share it with me. He said, I'm, <laughs> I'm never there anyway. <laughs> so I always remember Ron for, for letting me share his dress. Oh, I'd forgotten that. At the mechanic theater. <laughs> well, I had forgotten that. I was a nice guy then. <laughs> <laughs> those, those were the days. Those were the days. And, and of course, our buddy Lou Stadlin, Lou yeah. Stadlin's daughter, yeah. was in the show. So Lou was around too in, in Baltimore. Yeah. Small world. And, and, and my daughter, Jamie, yeah. who comes, was one year old and learned to walk backstage. I came out of Ron's dressing room and my one-year-old daughter, who was mm. playing with the kids backstage, walked to me for the first time. Oh, that's great. <laughs> well, tell Kayla I said hi. And, uh, I will do that. A great meeting you, Brett. Nice to meet you, Ron. Thanks so All much. Right. All the best. Thank yeah, you. Stay safe. Okay, say, say hi. I will, I will, Larry. Right, see. Bye, you Thanks, Brad. Their sweeter music when she speaks Isn't there A different bloom about her cheeks Isn't there Could I be wrong, could it be so Oh, where, oh, where did Gigi go? Gigi, am I a fool without a mind? Or have I merely been too blind to realize? Oh, Gigi, why, you've been growing up before my eyes. Gigi, you're not at all that funny, awkward little girl I knew. Oh, no, overnight there's been a breathless change. While you were trembling on the brink, was I out yonder somewhere blinking at a star? Oh, Gigi, have I been standing up too close or back too far? When did your sparkle turn to fire and your warmth become desire? For oh, what miracle has made you the way you are? Back to fall. When did 
just sparkle, turn to fire, and your warmth become desire. Oh, what miracle has made?